Welcome to a two or maybe even a three-parter on winter carp fishing. Made a load of notes, so um, I'm not a bit reading from a script or anything, but there's quite a lot that I want to go through, things that I've picked up over the years of doing it, um, and tips and advice and pointers that I can pass on to you guys. So it's quite a meaty old subject, and um, there's lots of different uh, subject headings that I want to cover, and they're going to range from things like location obviously through to rigs should we change our rigs in the winter and uh, of course bait what sort of bait is going to work best for us when it's really really cold i mean we're qualified to uh, do a winter film now it's uh, well into december and i think the air temperature at the moment we've got a tiny bit of sunshine coming through which is melting some of the ice that was clinging to the tree branches but uh, it's still only about one or two degrees so it's definitely winter out here and the first point that I want to touch on bearing in mind that some of you guys watching this might be um, veterans of the winter campaign but also you know a lot of people will be coming into carp fishing or maybe staring down the barrel of their first ever winter so there will be a few basics that I want to outline and um, a lot of those will fall under the, the sort of heading of, of comfort on the bank because it is very very important and it's an old army saying that says any fool can be uncomfortable and you see particularly where I, I come from down in Essex a lot of people think it's quite cool to go winter carping in a pair of white chainers they do <laughs> uh, and you know they'll take a brolly no ground sheet because ground sheets aren't cool and um, if you keep doing that, not only will it not be very pleasurable, but you'll start looking beyond your years quite quickly. You think about it, you're sleeping out in the freezing cold, the damp air and everything, you're living little better than somebody who's homeless on the streets really. And especially if your diet's not good as well and you're just eating rubbish. So if you wanna get through it and enjoy it, being comfortable is absolutely paramount. There's a few things that I will use in the winter. Uh, I mean, all summer, I will never use a, a ground sheet or anything like that. But once it gets to now, you put a ground sheet down, it really helps. And you can see that when you pack the ground sheet up, the underside of it is always really wet. And that's all moisture that's gonna rise up out of the ground into the bed chair and not do you any good at all. So a ground sheet or even half a ground sheet, I quite often cut mine down so that it's not the full size or fold it underneath. So it's just big enough to, to protect the bed chair area, maybe a couple of holdalls. I do use a winter skin. There's nothing worse than those really heavily condensing nights where you get all that moisture on the inside of the bivy. It's dripping on your pillow, it's dripping on your face and everything. I mean, yeah, you can tolerate it for one night, but if you, it's better not to. So a winter skin thrown over the top does make a massive, massive difference to the comfort levels. And it stops things like, you know, it stops your bed getting damp. Damp beds are not clever. They're not healthy. You get mould on your pillow. The spores of that you're breathing in, they're really not good for you. So try and keep your kit dry. Try and keep it comfortable. And actually do check your pillow every few trips because if you're starting to get mould on it, stick it in a hot wash or throw it away because that's really not good for you. Um, and in terms of that, in terms of, of clothing and so on, snoods. You know, there's a few gems out there that I can just throw you. A snood round your neck. This is a fleece and wool one. Absolute lifesaver. That, a good woolly hat. And the other thing that makes you bulletproof is a pair of salopettes, which I'm wearing now. Salopettes are things that go up like dungarees, if you're not familiar with the term. You know, they keep your back warm and, and they just make you feel like you can cope with anything. Lastly, footwear, you know, don't be a one of the trainer brigade. Don't be a welly wearer. They are cold and horrible as well. Get yourself some good footwear. I've just got some North Face um, snow boots on here, which I've had for about six or seven years probably. Really warm, really toasty. So spending a bit of time to think about being comfortable is, is very, very important. It's all about layers. This time of year, it's uh, thermal underlayers, which you can either get from you know, an outdoor store or various companies make thermal underlayers. And I mix those up with micro fleeces. So if you've got thermal underlayers and then a couple of micro fleeces and then a hoodie and then something thick like this, you're pretty much bulletproof, especially when there's not really any wind. So bear those things in mind, snoods, good footwear, 
and salopettes and lots of layers. They will help you get through the winter and be comfortable because believe me, winter fishing is hard. You need, you need to have a good sturdy mental resolve and the first things that will be chipping away at that will be numb toes um, or a damp bed or any kind of discomfort. So if you cover all those bases, it gets you in a good mental plane to deal with the objective of being there, which of course is to try and catch a carp. Now, when you set out on a winter campaign, it is imperative that you do so on a lake that has got some winter form. Unless you're, you're lucky enough to be fishing an unknown quantity in a, you know, a private lake or somewhere that doesn't get much pressure, then choose your venues wisely. If you look at form and talk to anglers and do a bit of digging, you will find that some lakes really do shut up shop in the winter. I wouldn't disregard those entirely necessarily because sometimes they're just not getting fished and the end result of that is that nothing's going to get caught. But it is true to say that some lakes are really, really not good propositions in the winter. And conversely, of course, there are lakes which are absolute bankers in the winter. So what are the things that separate those, those two types of venue? Now, if I think back over all the, all the winters that I've done, and have a quick look at my list as well. Um, the first thing to consider, there's a few key areas and, and one of the first things that I always consider is the depth of the lake. Now, all of the lakes I've fished in the winter that have been really good to me have a couple of common denominators and one of those is depth. When you get uh, a lot of depth in a lake, it can be very, very tricky in the winter. Generally speaking, I've found the best winter waters to be those with quite a shallow water volume. So what do I mean by shallow? Anything from three or four foot maybe, as shallow as that, up to maybe 10 foot. You know, I would put those in a shallow bracket, if you like. So I think my, my reasoning for that I mean, they're, they're, they're facts that I've found, but the reason in when I think about it as to why that might be, I arrive at the conclusion that during the winter period, carp spend inordinate amount of time off the bottom. They may spend as much as 95% of, of, of a 24 hour period off the bottom, maybe more than that, suspended at whatever level in the water column they are comfortable at due to water pressure, thermoclines, temperature. Now, of course, zigs do play a part. I am not the world's best zig angler. Uh, I'm not even halfway up the Premier League. I'm in the Deodora League somewhere. But um, uh, zigs do play a part, and um, we'll, we'll cover those a, a bit more later. But when you bear in mind that the fish will be spending a lot of time off the bottom, let's say mid-water. Now, if you've got a lake that is 20 foot deep and the fish are mid-water, they're 10 foot above your potential traps, your potential baited area. Now, if the weather is really cold and the carp are quite inactive, it takes quite a lot of inclination from a carp, quite a lot of motivation to tip up and drop down through 10 foot of water, quite a long way when you're semi-torpid and have a feed. Conversely, if you've got a shallow lake, let's say the depth is about six foot, and the fish are mid-water, then they're going to be three foot above any potential traps that you've laid. That means that you are a lot closer to the fish. If you think about it, you're miles closer to the fish than you are in deep water at any one time. Not only are you much closer to the fish, but it requires less motivation and effort just to tip down and have a quick truffle. So I think that is one of the key reasons why shallow lakes are better than really deep lakes, simply because the fish are closer to where your traps are gonna be at any given time. Now stock plays a big role. If you are targeting a lake which is low stock, and by low stock I probably mean anything in terms of acreage, more than 20 acres with less than 50 carp, you know, you're starting to get low fish per acreage. And the way I think of it in terms of the stock is that at any one time in a 20 in any 24 hour period i believe that something is going to be willing 
to drop down and feed. It might be one or two percent of the stock. So if you've got a lake with 100 carp in it, during that 24 hour period, if it's brutal and it's really horrible, maybe one or two of those fish, if you're on them, will be willing, they're not all gonna go down and feed because that's not how winter carp fishing works. It's, it is harder because the fish are feeding less often and less of the fish are feeding because they all have um, different physiology. Some will, will require a bit of food during the winter, others might not eat anything throughout the winter. But if a couple of percent of your stock or 5% of your stock are going to be willing to drop down and feed in any 24 hour period, then, you know, in a hundred fish stock, that's five fish, double it, 10 fish and so on. So that's my reasoning again, it's just, it's simplistic I know, but I've only got a simple brain. But I think the bigger the number of fish, then obviously the more um, percentage wise, you've got a chance of fish that are going to be willing to feed. And when you drop that down to really small stocks, you can see that one or 2% of the fish willing to feed doesn't really equal, equate to anything at all. So big numbers of fish play a major part. So if you can choose a lake that is not overly deep, that has a good stock of fish, then you are two, two parts of, of the way on to choosing, in my opinion, a winning winter water. Weed, weed plays a big part. Weed, I used to think, meant that the weedier the lake, the less likely it was to fish in the winter. But I have had a few good winters on very, very weedy lakes, but you have to obviously be exactly where the fish are. The fish will sit in the weed for long periods of time, but if you know where they are and you can fish up tight to those weed beds, then they can be very, very lucrative indeed. The weed will also give you a bit of a, as it does in the summer, a bit of insulation from the things that you're gonna to need to do as you go about your fishing. You're marking up, you're spotting, and uh, getting fishing in the first place. And if there's weed about, the fish will just melt into that weed and they will feel safe and protected and they will usually come out and play at some point later on. On lakes where I've fished where there isn't much weed, I've tended to find the fish much more mobile. In fact, sometimes if you've got a reasonable winter, they can be mobile throughout the entire winter, moving on winds, sometimes even cold winds, and they can be quite flighty in terms of pressure as well. I remember fishing down at Chiller Mill a few winters ago, not a, not a shred of weed anywhere and <clears throat> it's a shallow lake good stock of fish so 250 300 fish i think from memory average depth maybe six foot very very good winter water one of the best that i've ever fished and that winter there was no weed and the fish were very flighty and they would respond to pressure they would respond to wind and sunshine um, but they you know you could I probably that winter i probably caught from I don't know, off the top of my head, let's say 10 different swims, which is not your typical winter carp fishing. You know, normally you'll find one or two or three swims will be key in a winter campaign because the fish will be um, concentrated in those zones. So less weed is usually a good thing, but it can mean the fish will move around more. Lots of weed in deep water is generally not a good thing. If you've got a lot of weed and deep water and a low stock, you're going to be up against it because those small number of fish will be incumbent in that weed for long periods of time and they will take a lot of catching to the point that waters like that i mean i would never say there's always a chance obviously but waters like that i've fished a lot in the past and most of my fishing in the summertime is on on hard clear weedy lakes with low stocks and and in the winter i tend to try and go somewhere where I've got more of a chance of a bite. Um, you know, summer's hard enough, you know, winter's hard enough, you know, once you get into those months, it is nice to get a few bites. It's always a nice, it's also a nice time of year to do socials with mates, you know, catch a couple of twenties if you can, a couple of doubles, you know, it's fantastic. So I've got a few waters earmarked that I regularly fall back on that have really, really good winter form and they tend to tick the boxes that I've already mentioned. So if I look down the, um, uh, down the, the list of other pointers. So pressure and bait also play a part. Now, the more of a hammering that a particular water has had throughout the calendar year leading up to winter, generally speaking, the harder it's going to be during those winter months. They will have seen more bait, so they will have eaten a lot more and they will be 
in their winter plumage. They're not going to be underweight. They're not going to need any kind of feed up. They're going to have all the fat resources they need to get through the winter. And they will be very wary of getting caught because they will have seen pressure applied to them throughout the entire year. So generally speaking, the venues that get an awful lot of pressure can be tricky in the winter. It doesn't put them off grid. You know, lakes like Sandhurst and various other places that are really pressured still perform well in the winter and, and I've done well at them, but it does mean that you need to think about your angling and how you're going to apply your trade. Um, if you've got access to a lake that gets very little pressure, uh, and you're very lucky, give me a ring. But if you have got access to a lake that gets very, very little angling pressure, then that means it won't have seen much bait during the year, so the fish aren't going to be overly plump and they won't have seen loads of pressure and the lakes of that nature that i fished in the past the ones that get very little anglers footfall throughout the year can be brilliant winter venues regardless of the weather you know it, it's really they are that definitely there is a correlation between the amount of angling pressure and the amount of bait applied throughout the year as to how good the potential winter will be so if you've maybe got a quiet club water in the back of your mind that hasn't been fished too much this year or, um, or somewhere off the beaten track or maybe even a bit of river or something, you know, they could all be well worth a look because no matter how cold it gets, carp don't spend all of their time doing nothing or very rarely. If they're very big old fish and there's not many of them, they could spend a lot of time sat in thick weed if there is thick weed all winter. But... You know, if we're looking at the sort of venues that tick the boxes that I've just outlined to you, then you're going to be in with a chance as long as you can find them. And finding them, of course, is the real trick. The key factor that makes winter carp fishing challenging in terms of getting a carp on the bank is location. The carp will generally be using a much, much smaller part of, of the lake's topography than they will at any other time of the year which means that you could have 99% of your stock or even the entirety of your stock in maybe 1% of the water. A lot of it can be devoid of fish and some areas will be completely not travelled in at all until the springtime comes round. So that means it's very very easy in the winter to put yourself in the wrong place. And of course, if you do that at any time, you're not going to catch. But in the winter, it's doubly punishing because in the winter, if you do get your location wrong, unlike the summer, the fish aren't going to come and find you. Whereas in the summer, you get it wrong. The fish are still quite active, traveling around the lake. There is a good chance that they will come across you at some point. In the winter, that's very, very unlikely to happen. And that's why the cornerstone of all successful winter angling I mean, let's be honest, it's a cornerstone of all carp angling, but in the winter, for the reasons that I just outlined, location is absolutely paramount. And if you get it wrong, there is no recourse, you know, you will be punished. So there's a, there's a few different notes that I've made just to talk about location. Um, pointers that I've um, been a, a alerted to in the past and things that I've learned that I can pass on to you. The, the key thing is, that like any aspect of carp location, I can't say to you, find the deep water, find the bits of clay, find the whatever, because every single lake is different. And everything, every pointer that you might read in a carp fishing book or watch on someone's blog or hear from me, they should only be taken as pointers, as guidelines to possibly fall back on if you have nothing else to go on. I can think of, I mean, it's, it's well into December now. As I said, it's freezing cold. I can think of three lakes off the top of my head where I think I'd have a very good chance finding the fish in areas of shallow water as opposed to the deeper parts of the lake. I can also think of two other lakes where the fish are in the deeper parts. I can think of one lake where it's all about getting on the rock hard patches and other lakes where you're better off in the silt. So as I said, these are only locational guidelines. Always remember the carp will be where they want to be, not where you want them to be or not where you expect them to be. And they will 
consistently surprise you. You know, I can think of quite a few times where I've been, oh, no, I really didn't see that coming, you know, and, and they turn up in the area you least expect it. Might be in February on the end of an easterly wind that you can't even bear to stand in. It's unusual, but these things do happen. I remember fishing a lake um, called Ladywell near Stansted Airport a lot, lot of years ago. I was doing a tutorial down there and uh, there was a big southwesterly blowing up the top end of the lake and the top end of the lake where it narrowed off was, was much shallower than the rest and the wind was howling up there. It wasn't particularly cold because it was one of those winter storms that you get but it still wasn't that pleasant to be in. But um, we were fishing down at the dammed end of the lake, which was deeper water. I think you had maybe sevens or eights as opposed to half that at the, at the shallow end. And um, we were fishing there because we had seen a, a fish roll and a little bit of fizzing before the wind got up. So we were fishing there and um, during the course of the session, this wind got up and it was, you know, white tops going up the other end of the lake. And my client said to me, he asked a really good question. He said, what about following the wind in the, in the winter time? And because uh, there's no wind or anything, we've got paragliders going out over us, um, different places. So if you hear any noise, that's what they are. I'm not going to keep stopping for them because they drive me mad. Um, so he said, well, what about the wind? You know, would they follow it in the winter? And I said, no, nah. in the winter, they pretty much get in an area and generally they'll, they'll stay in that area. But I said, I'll tell you what though, there's no rules, let's go and have a look. So we got our Polaroids and we went all the way up the other end of the lake and climbed out on some snags, looked down into the branches and sure enough, the carp were all there. And like probably the entire stock had moved up there on these winds. And these white tops waves were coming up the lake like, you know, a foot high smashing into these snags and these fish were underneath that in three or four foot of water. We moved and we caught. And that was always, it's always, I mean, that was probably the best part of 10 years ago, but that stuck in my mind as a, a very stark observation that it doesn't matter how long you've been doing it, there are always instances that will utterly surprise you. And it comes back to what I said at the beginning, there are no rules. The only way you know that you are fishing in the right spot is if you've either caught something or is if you've seen something. Um, obviously to get you in that spot you won't have caught something it'll be it will be something you've seen so there is nothing more reliable than seeing what I call carp flesh come out of the water or roll over and you know I get a lot of messages on social media and so on like now it's the middle of winter shall I fish the deeper silter areas or should I do this or should I fish the island overhangs or whatever it might be and I can never reply with a certainty because every lake is different and you have to bear that in mind on your lake. If you just go in fishing to um, parameters or guidelines that you think are the rules, then unless you're very lucky, you could come away empty handed every trip. Now, if you've got nothing else to go on, sure, use them as a starter for 10. But if you then sit back, zip the front up, put your DVD player on and make a few Bailey's coffees, then if you've got it wrong, you're not giving yourself an opportunity to put it right. And this is where, this is where the real separation between the, the guys that catch and the guys who catch not as many comes into play. From October onwards, on almost every lake that I've ever fished, it's all about nocturnal activity. So that's dusk up to midnight, and sometimes beyond midnight, you know, there's a few times I can think of this year where they, I've heard them crashing out two, three in the morning. But certainly the first part of the night is, is absolutely paramount. And in the old days, when I was younger and sillier, it was all about getting to the lake, getting in an area that I thought looked good, getting set up and getting the rods out before it got dark so I knew everything was perfect. And that was quite a foolhardy way to angle. It's probably how I see the majority of people still angle these days, but my angling is now entirely different. Bearing in mind that on almost every lake, the fish will be active in the first part of the night, eight in the evening, nine in the evening, six in the, whatever it is, they, they will almost always give themselves away. So for me, 
rather than getting set up perfectly comfortable and dry and getting the rods out perfect in an area that may not have fish in, I will instead walk around the lake and I will listen or I'll stand in certain areas, sometimes for hours, waiting to hear one. And sooner or later, almost always, you do. And, you know, I can think of so many winters where I've just walked around in waterproofs with a handheld golf umbrella or something and you just stand in there for hours and, it, and it, it's an extreme type of carping I'm giving away you know some of the biggest edges here but I don't really mind because I know that probably 98% of the people watching this still won't do it it will still be an edge effort is an edge effort is one of the biggest edges it's what will separate you from everybody else it's not going into angling an angling a tackle shop and buying a, a brown paper bag full of all the little gadgets and bits that's cost you 120 quid for that little brown paper bag or watching a dvd that's trying to sell you tackle or something like that it's nothing like that what will separate you from other anglers is in here and what you're prepared to do and that really you know although that can manifest or it does manifest itself hugely in in summer campaigns climbing trees moving swims getting the floater rods out setting up a stalking spot moving again whatever it might be in the winter it's it's the same it's the same effort it's just a different kind of effort and as i said although i have eyes on the water all day um, compared to the summer you don't really see the shows at first light it's always worth looking and i always do it and sometimes you do see them but it's more about the nocturnal hours so as I said, I will walk around and more than happily, my objective is to find them in the dark, whatever lake I'm on, and then I'll set up at nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, cast out in the dark and I'll be on the fish. Usually you'll start getting liners from the off. We'll talk about liners in, in a bit. And, um, and you'll end up with a fish. Now, although I might have got wet walking around with my umbrella and, um, and I might have set up in the rain or whatever, doesn't matter you soon forget about all that when you're holding a carp and it's freezing cold effort is so the nocturnal activities is is a massive massive part your eyes and ears become well they're still your main weapons as they as they are in the summer your main weapons when it's pitch black your ears become obviously um, a massive massive weapon and um, I don't know if I, I I don't know if my hearing is like uh, <laughs> super tuned or what. And you certainly do get tuned in to certain things. I mean, there's been quite a few times, even recently, I can think of on a lake where there was um, carp showing two swims down, and there was a guy in the swim between me and the fish. And when I spoke to him, he hadn't heard them, and I had heard these fish sloshing over, and I leapfrogged him, moved in and moved in, and um, and got fishing on the carp and. Some people just don't seem to hear them and that might be because they've got a radio on or a DVD player or they've got the, the front zipped up. If you don't know where the fish are, you have to have your eyes and ears going and sometimes you'll hear one in the dark and if you're stood there by the boards at the front of the swim and you hear one, you will be able to instantly have some kind of gauge on what it was towards and how far out it was. You might think, oh, do you know what? It's towards the corner of the lake, about 80 yards, there or thereabouts. If you were in your bivvy, by the time you've heard something and then you come out, you, you, you really have, it's all guesswork. And you, almost all the fish that I catch every winter are on casts that I've made in the dark to estimations that I've made on where the activity is that I've heard. Oh, is it about 80 yards, 85 yards? So I'll put two rods out there and it works. It works so, so well, just with bags or um, you used to use stringers a bit or, or maybe a couple of spoms or whatever it is. You have to be where they are and it requires a lot of effort to do so. So that's the key point. With winter location, it's, it's very, very much about the nocturnals. Now, on a lot of lakes, if you don't know where the fish are, then a good starting point can be the middle section of a lake. Um, I mean, the Syndicate Lake I'm fishing at the moment has been 
fished really, really hard in the middle zone and now even now that the activity that I'm seeing is 30, 40 yards out from the bank. You know, the fish have stayed in close, even though it's absolutely freezing cold. They're just not using that middle zone. The birds are out there all the time picking up old bait. But thinking of all the lakes that I have fished over the years, the very, very middle, if you imagine like uh, Marksman's crosshairs through a site on a, on a map of a lake, middle for diddle, we used to call it, very, very often a good starting point if you've nothing else to go on. So after the considerations on the middle, the furthest out from the bank, that middle zone, which is always attractive to carp. Again, there are no rules. I can think of several lakes where it's not about the middle. So I'm just giving you pointers and guidelines if you've nothing else to go on, if you haven't seen any fish. Maybe somewhere that when you get to the lake, you're gonna put your rods out and then you're gonna walk around in the dark listening with your sounder box and see what's, what's going on, a couple of swims down here and there. Sound travels a long way at night and the more you get used to listening, the better your, your ears get. And it's the same as what I talk about uh, when I talk about optical calories. The more visual application you use on the surface of a lake, the better your eyes get at discerning those tiny details, small bubbles, subtle rolls and so on. So it's all about fine tuning your senses and getting yourself to a point where you're at one with the lake. And if a fish sloshes over 90 yards out quietly at nine in the evening, not only are you gonna hear it, but you're gonna have a pretty good idea what it was in line with, and you can put your rods in that area. You know, Because these are the things which make or break a winter campaign. They really do. Um, if your lake has areas of thick reeds, very, very well worth a look. Um, specifically, if the reeds have got a depth in them. You know, if you've got two foot or more, they don't need a lot. If you've got two, if you've got three or four foot, then it's game on. Thick reeds with a lot of water in them are absolute magnets for carp. I think of some places in the past where I've been, Orchid was a good example, extensive areas of reeds and the fish would spend, in, at some t sometimes they would spend the entire winter out in these bed, beds of reeds. Remember a place called Bramble Mere out in the Cotswolds, must be getting on for 20 years ago now, but um, there was a, a, an area of reed beds and in the, in, the, in the middle of the reed bed was this, like an aquarium where the reeds didn't grow and we used to put a bit of bait down for the fish and it was all sand and shingle and beautiful on the bottom. And we used to stand there with, a, I remember one night standing there with, do you know what, I don't think we had head torches then. It was back when we used to have little mag lights and you'd either hold them in your mouth for tying a rig, <laughs> dribbling down it, or, uh, or you'd, you'd hold it conventionally. But um, I remember standing there watching them with a torch in the middle of the night, like midnight, when it was snowing in two and a half, three foot of water eating bait that we had put in. Perfectly active, um, but um, the, the very, very focused on areas of reeds if they have access to them. Of course, when they're in reeds, it's quite easy to tell because the stems will be moving. And I can think back to even some of my earliest winter carp fishing at a place called Soper's Farm in Harlow in the late 80s. And that was all just watching the reed stems. Wherever the reed stems were twitching, you put a rig as close as you could, a few baits, and that would do you a bite. So don't discount reeds. Carp love them because they provide cover. And it's the same with snags. Again, thinking back to somewhere like orchid lakes a long time ago there was a swim called the all alone right down the bottom of this arm and they have one massive snag probably the most reliable consistent winter peg not only on that lake but anywhere in that area you know the fish were in there because there was a good 10 or 12 foot well, was there that much probably not there was a lot of water volume under that snag and the fish would gather there in numbers every single winter so if you have got some deep water snags on your lake and you're not sure where the fish are, get yourself some Polaroids and have a good look into them. Maybe put a few grains of corn down where you can just see on the limit of your vision and keep an eye on, on see if they've been moved or displaced or eaten. In the past I found fish in snags just by looking down and if the vis isn't that great, I'm looking as far as I can. And although I never, on some occasions, never saw a carp, you might just see one willow leaf, just do that, and then go back down again, just where there's been a bit of displacement from carp that you can't see and that just caused a leaf to kick up or something. There's always signs, fish do like deep water snags, so again, that's an area 
um, to watch out for and have a look at. So on my list, I've also got, um, I've got liners. Now in terms of location, liners play a very, very big part in my opinion for winter carp fishing. And I can think of numerous occasions where I fished deliberately for liners and they've led me to the location of the carp because the carp for whatever reason weren't really very active or weren't really showing. If you cast to a particular spot, sink your line till the V's on the surface meet and it's under the surface um, and then clip on a lightweight bobbin on a reasonable drop. Sensitivity on maximum, assuming it's not blowing a gale so it'll drive you insane but you know uh, days like today are perfect. Your objective is to have as much line running through the water column as you can rather than pinned as close to the bottom as we would normally have it. And fishing for liners is a very, very good way of locating where the carp are. If you're getting big liners, let's say you're fishing, let's say you cast out 60 yards and you're getting big liners, then those fish are probably a fair bit closer um, than where you're casting. So more often than not the size of the liner is relative and proportionate to how far out the fish are. The bigger the liner and the faster it moves up and down the closer the fish will be and then you can recast your rigs accordingly. If you're fishing out at, at 60, any kind of range really, and you're getting little bleeps and knocks then that's fish that are out close to the bottom in the area where you're probably fishing and very often they will be a precursor to some action. So bear that in mind, liners are a very, very good way of working out where they are during the colder months. Um, again, I mean, assumption versus reality I've got written down. Again, it comes back to if you base your fishing on assumption and guesswork, it could be a very long, hard winter. You may get pay dirt, you may get what you need, but there is nothing more steadfastly reliable than the reality. And that's seeing a carp and knowing where they are and fishing that exact area. That's where, you, that's where you're aiming to be. And if you don't know where that area is at the start of your session, never stop striving to find where that is. And um, we'll talk about laziness and, and motivation um, a bit later, but um, Again, one other thing, winds. A lot of people talk about winds in the winter. Do they make much difference? I gave you an example earlier where they made a big difference. That was a surprise to me because historically in my carp fishing, I had not really thought winds made a big difference to the location of carp in the winter. And they clearly do on some lakes. Um, if there was a good body of wind, maybe a south or southwesterly and a low pressure, you get those classic winter conditions, good fishing weather, then it may be worth looking uh, at where the wind's blowing. But again, you're resorting back to guesswork. So if I knew where the carp were and I'd been catching them or seeing them in a particular area and the wind started blowing somewhere else, would I go and fish there? No, I wouldn't. I would fish where I'd known them to be and then if I saw something move in the area where the wind was blowing, I'd move around there very quickly. On lakes that have got good stocks and not too much weed and aren't overly deep, the fish can respond to winds quite quickly. Uh, they certainly did at Chill and Mill back, back uh, a few years ago and that, that winter. So winds are something to bear in mind as well. Um, but yeah, there, there are a few pointers for location. There is nothing more important in any season of carp fishing than location and right now, when it's brutally cold, it's absolutely everything. Bite times during the winter period will be very, or can be very, very defined indeed. It's always worth trying to find out as far as you can what's been going on, where, on at the lake you're fishing in terms of bite times. Now, although some people may be a bit um, preoccupied with finding out what swim, how many wraps, what colour Ronnie rig or any of that. Um, one of the key bits of information that I'm most interested, a lot more interested in, is what time was it going on? Did he have two fish between 9pm and 11pm? Or was it three in the afternoon? So if I, if I have the opportunity to ask an angler who's caught something, you know, most people don't mind giving away that sort of information. and 
and uh, I will always ask the question if I feel that I can. Not only, you know, even if someone said oh, I had a couple of liners, what time did you have those then, mate? Um, because that will give you an indication as to when the carp were most active. Usually the period that you will get your liners will, will coincide with the chance of a bite because the fish will be at most active and maybe nearer the bottom during that time you'll get the liners and quite often they'll be a, a precursor to a bite. So bite times allow you to plan your fishing accordingly and, and of course make sure that you're maximising your effectiveness during those windows. It may be that you were going to go home at 11 o'clock in the morning but that's bite time so you're going to stretch it out and you're going to pack up early afternoon or it may be that you're going to wind in all your rods and get the spom out and start baiting up and you might have an inclination to do that on dusk but you've actually found out that the last couple of fish that have been out have been on dusk. So you need to make sure that everything is set perfectly two or three hours ahead of any potential bite time window. It's also worth bearing in mind of course that bites can come, it's carp fishing, at any particular time but you will notice if it's a productive lake um, even if it's not that productive, you will tend to notice um, patterns. And that could be patterns in terms of the time you've seen one show, is the same time as you had a liner, is the same time as you got a bite. You tend to find patterns like that. Being able to maximise those is so important because, as I said earlier on, during any 24 hour period, you may find that the fish are only going to touch bottom for half an hour or an hour or less during that period of time. So you need to make sure that if you get a bite, you're back out there in the game as quickly as possible having had that fish. For me, it's about getting the fish in, unhooking it in the net, securing the net, setting up another landing net, getting the rig out, back on the spot. And so many times that has resulted in that rod going again in a very short space of time that one thing has caught me a lot of extra winter fish and you know it, even it to the point if I'm fishing a lake that maybe has a two rod rule then I might have a third rod that might be clipped up to the same spot with a fresh rig and a fresh bait on it ready to go so if I catch one as soon as it's in the net it's like competition fishing you know in, in, the, in the carp competitions organization and making the most of those windows of opportunity is key and will catch you the odd bonus extra fish. So that was a pretty meaty area location, winter preparedness, uh, maximising your windows of opportunity, etc. There's a lot there. Hopefully it's got your grey matter going over. Now, we're going to be moving on to part two shortly, and that is where we're going to be looking at rigs, hooks, bait, and liquid edges and everything else that goes into making a successful winter campaign once you've done those first important jobs of finding where those carp are. So join us in part two and I'll be showing you a few special little winter edges. Mm -hmm.